morning. Will you all stand up and let's worship Jesus together. <clears throat>
Amen. He's worthy. Good morning, Ridge Church. It's so good to see you this morning. And welcome to the third week of Advent. And we're anticipating the birth of Christ, the promise fulfilled. And uh, this morning, I wanted to share with you from Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. And in this chapter, Joseph is asleep. He's dreaming, and an angel appears to him in his dream and says to him in verse 23, Look, a virgin will conceive a son, and she will give birth to him, and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And so this morning, I want us to focus on the fact that God is with us. Here in this very room, he is with us. He's ready to meet us wherever we are. I don't know if you're full of joy this morning, he's ready to meet you right there. If you're full of sadness or loneliness or grief this morning, he's ready to meet you there too. And this morning, let's just worship God and remember that he is right here, ready to meet us where we are. Amen.
song is a favorite of many, a favorite of mine for sure, and um, it just makes me think if you all have ever wondered about what Mary thought um, when she realized, here I am pregnant with a baby, I'm a virgin, and, and you know, who, who is this, um, you know, this baby that will come in the form of I mean, he's love and he's hope and all of these things, but do you ever wonder just what she's thinking, you know, what's going through her head? So the song talks a lot, a lot about those, those things, and it's just a, a beautiful song and I um, want you to think about just who Jesus is and, and think about those things as we sing this song together. y'all we're about to have church in here this morning y'all ready i don't know where you've been but i know where i've been i know how far jesus has reached down to pick me up out of the muck and the mire you know place my feet on a solid rock put a new song in my mouth here's another song one of those new songs you know been 
been healed by Savior. I feel far from above. I've been down to the river. I ain't the same. Prodigal return. Y'all know this singing with me. Oh, my hope is in Jesus. Thank God that yesterday is gone. Oh, my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by.
womb of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Listen to this. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb left his bed. Today, this Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent is all about joy. All right. Hey, look at that a little microphone power. That's good. I don't have to yell at you. So, hey, uh, if you're new here at Ridge Church today, we're so glad that you're here. In fact, if you would just do me a quick favor, is take out your phone and text the word hello to 276-8107. Uh, we'd love for you to do that. You can just let us know that you're here, and we're going to send you a quick text me message back. And uh, that's a great way for you to just let us know a little bit about yourself, and we can get to know you. You can get to know us, and you can text us anytime. Any questions that you have about the church uh, by texting the word hello to 276-8107. So for the rest of us, we're going to give together here in just a moment. There'll be some baskets come by your row. You can give that way, or you can go online to ridgegive.com, and you can give online there together also. And then we'll just hop into today's message here in just a moment. So let me pray for us. We will give together, and you can give by the baskets or going online. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this gathering together with us here this moment, this morning, God. God, we pray that as we give this morning, Father, God, that we honor you in our giving. God, that we give with generous and sacrificial love. God, that we give with glad and joyous hearts on this day of joy. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, if um, if you have a kid who is singing in uh, with Rich Kids next Sunday for our Christmas service, uh, they're going to practice at nine fifteen next Sunday. Nine fifteen. So make sure that you have them here uh, at nine fifteen, a little bit early. The service next week is at ten o'clock. I'll tell you a little bit more about that here in just a little bit. But uh, we're going to hop into today's message. Uh, the other day, uh, I was on Twitter and I posted uh, on Twitter my five favorite, top five favorite Christmas movies. And uh, I got to be honest, some people didn't like my list. They didn't like my list. And that's okay, because it's my list, not their list, and they'll get over it. But uh, would you like to know what my top five are? Would you like to, like to know that? It's, you can judge me if you want to. It's okay. I'm going to judge you too. So it's all right. But I'm, I'm just kidding. So uh, here are my top five in no particular order. Uh, top five favorite Christmas movies. Uh, number one, Four Christmases. Four Christmases, love that movie, it's hilarious, uh, reminds me too much of some of y'all's family, but uh, I'm just kidding. Four Christmases, great movie, great Christmas movie, love it. Uh, another one, gotta be on the list, I've watched this movie like forever, and I love that they play it for 24 straight hours. A Christmas Story is one of my favorite, uh, yeah, y'all like that one, yeah. Christmas Story. I've been to the Christmas Story house in Cleveland. It actually exists. It's there. It's still there on Cleveland Street there in Cleveland. So uh, A Christmas Story is on my list. You got to have this on your list. Christmas Vacation. Got to have that on the list. That is definitely on the list. Everybody needs a little Cousin Eddie in their life. Uh, you know, because we all have one in our families, right? We all have that Cousin Eddie in our families. And if you think, well, I don't have a Cousin Eddie in my family. You're the one. 
That's because you're the one. You're the Cousin Eddie. All right, so uh, love that one, love that one. Uh, this one's on the list, Elf. You got to have Elf on the list, right? Buddy the Elf, you got to have Elf. That one's on the list. My favorite part in that movie is when he talks to the narwhal. That's my favorite part in the whole movie. <laughs> love that. Hi, Mr. Narwhal. Anyway, so uh, love that, love that part. Now, this one is a little controversial, you know, so maybe, maybe this is on your list, maybe it's not on your list, but this is number five. It's not really a movie. It's not really a movie. Uh, in fact, it's only about 35 minutes long, and it's a cartoon. Charlie Brown Christmas, that's right. Charlie Brown Christmas is on, is on l- the list. And if you're thinking, okay, so where's Die Hard? It's an honorable mention. It's a Christmas movie, okay? Don't at me on that. It's a Christmas movie. It's an honorable mention. It's on the list. So is Polar Express, Just Friends, and a couple of others. But anyway, nevertheless, those are some of my favorite Christmas movies. And you're like, okay, so what does this have to do with anything? Charlie Brown, the Charlie Brown Christmas. I want to stop there for just a moment because every time I watch a Charlie Brown Christmas, I notice something new. I notice something different. Like there's a, there's a part of that. Like there's times when I'm watching a Charlie Brown Christmas and... It's just kind of on in the background, right? And, and, and maybe that's the way that you do Christmas movies a lot of times. Like, it's just kind of on in the background. Sometimes you really sit down and watch it. Sometimes it's just kind of background noise for you. If you're watching online, maybe you're watching a Christmas movie while you're watching this message too. But, like, you know, so, like, it's just there, right? But then there are times when you just sit down and you really just pay attention. And so a couple of years ago, I remember sitting down and really, like, just watching a Charlie Brown Christmas and really paying attention to the dialogue. And really paying attention to, to what was happening in there. And, and we all know a Charlie Brown Christmas. And probably the one thing that sticks out to your mind the most is the part where Linus recites Luke chapter 2, right? And so we're just like, oh, I love that part. That's great. And I love that part too. And that's a big part of the movie. But to me, the one thing that sticks out, and I just noticed this a couple of years ago, the one thing that sticks out is actually the very opening scene of a Charlie Brown Christmas. You have Linus and you have Charlie Brown. They're kind of hanging out there on the wall, right? Like, like this block wall that they always hang out at, around, right? They're just kind of sitting there chatting back and forth. And Charlie Brown says something really interesting to Linus. And, of course, Linus has a great response to him. But this is, this is what Charlie Brown says. He says this. He says, he says you know, I, I think there must be something wrong with me. That's what Charlie Brown says. He says, I think there must be something wrong with me, Linus. He says, Christmas is coming, but I'm not happy. Christmas is coming, I'm not happy. And you don't have to raise your hand to that, but, but a lot of us can identify with that, right? Christmas is coming, but I'm not happy. But listen to what else he says. He says, I'm not happy. He says, I don't feel the way that I'm supposed to feel. Don't you hate it when everybody tells you the way that you're supposed to feel about Christmas, right? Because there are probably some of you in the room, and maybe some people that were in the first service, you don't, like, this is blasphemy, I know, but you're like, I don't really like Christmas. Like, I don't like the Christmas holiday. Like, you like what it means, but you don't like everything else that goes along with it. This is what Charlie Brown says. He says, he says I, I always end up feeling depressed. He says, he goes, I guess, he goes, I just don't understand Christmas. I like getting presents and sending Christmas cards and decorating trees and all that, but I'm still not happy. I just always end up feeling depressed. A lot of us feel that way at Christmas time, don't we? It's like we're supposed to be happy. We know that we're supposed to have joy and we're supposed to be excited and supposed to have this anticipation, but there's a part of Christmas that comes along and we kind of feel like Charlie Brown. I love what Linus says back to him. Listen to what Linus says. Linus responds by saying maybe the most brilliant line in the entire 30-minute cartoon. This is what Linus says. He says, Charlie Brown, he says, you are the only person I know who can take a wonderful season like Christmas and turn it into a problem. (laughs) How many of you know somebody like that, right? He says, you're the only person I know that can take something like Christmas and turn it into a problem. Then he says this. He says, maybe Lucy's right. Of all the Charlie Browns in the world, you are the Charlie Browniest. Right? You ever say that to somebody at Christmas time? You are the Charlie Browniest person I know. Right? This is what Linus says, and I, I love that. I, I, love that. I love that whole scene there. But the entire cartoon, the entire Charlie Brown cartoon, is really about Charlie Brown trying to find the meaning of Christmas. He's trying to find the meaning of Christmas. 
And you know the part, right? Like, oh, they're Charlie Brown, he's, he's directing the big production. He's directing the big Christmas play. And, you know, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. And it's loud and everything. And Charlie Brown's in there. And he gets frustrated. And he screams at the top of his lungs, right? And he says, can somebody tell me what the meaning of Christmas is, right? And everybody gets quiet. And everybody's kind of got like a puzzled look on their face. And then Linus, right? Linus speaks up. And he recites Luke chapter 2. It's like, this is the meaning of Christmas. And Linus is right. That is part of the meaning of Christmas. But I think and I feel, and I don't just think and feel, I know, according to the scriptures, that Christmas is actually a little bit more than just that. Because if you watch closely, Charlie Brown experiences a lot of what most of us do at Christmas. And so his question his search for what is what is the meaning of christmas why do we do all this like why do why do all these things happen like like even luke chapter 2 and and the announcement of the angels and the birth of jesus like what does all of this even mean for us see charlie brown like even in this cartoon we see him dealing with depression We see Charlie Brown dealing with self-worth issues. We see Charlie Brown dealing with weird family dynamics. Like, where are his parents? That's what I want to know. Where are his parents? I've never seen them in a Charlie Brown cartoon, right? Like, but so he's got this weird family dynamics, right? He's dealing with crushing relationships. That relationship between him and Lucy is toxic, okay? It is toxic. I'm just telling you right now. So he's dealing with crushing relationships, and he's dealing with loneliness, Dealing with loneliness. Well, the Charlie Brown cartoon it really speaks, I think, a lot to a lot of our lives and a lot of our situations, even, even now. A lot of us feel like Charlie Brown. A lot of us feel like Charlie Brown. It hits a little, maybe a little too close to home for some of us. So what is the meaning of Christmas? You see, if I were to just poll this room or our church or, or just Oak Ridge in general, we would literally, if I said, hey, what, what does Christmas mean to you? What's, what, is, what does Christmas mean? We'd get a hundred different answers, right? We, and some people would say, well, Jesus, it's about Jesus coming. It's about the arrival of Christ. It's about this. It's about that. It's about family. It's about gathering. It's about, you know, all of these things. And, and, and some of those things would be right. Some of them would be wrong, but some of them would be right. But they, we'd get all kinds of answers. And so literally, truly, what is then the meaning of Christmas? What, what, is it, what does it all mean? So I'm going to give you the point of the message today. I'm just going to go ahead and give it to you right here, right up front. So if you check out and you get this, like, you're good. So here's the, here's the whole point. Here's the whole point. The reason for Christmas is that Jesus came, listen, that Jesus didn't come to just give us peace, but Jesus came to be peace. The reason for Christmas Not the meaning necessarily, but the reason for Christmas is that Jesus didn't come to just give us peace, but he came to be our peace. Now, today's message is going to be a little bit different than than most messages on a typical Sunday here. Today, we're going to get a little geeky, if that's okay with you, and we're going to do a little Bible study. Is that okay? We do that. So we're going to use the Bible a lot. If you have your Bible with you, uh, we're going to be flipping around a little bit. If you have your Uversion Bible app, uh, we're going to mark a whole lot of stuff. But if you're following along, all of today's scripture that I'm going to use is going to be in there. You can save it. It'll be on the screen back here behind me as well. But um, if you, when you think about it, when you think about it, uh, Christmas is so much, it, it, it's, there's a lot around it. We think about Christmas and we think about a lot of different things. But, but here recently, I've been really just kind of focusing in on, on this simple fact that the reason for Christmas is that Jesus came to be our peace. And that word peace is really important. So we're actually just going to do a little Bible study on the word peace this morning. Because I think it's going to mean everything to us when all is said and done. And so when I say peace, when I say peace, I, this, like we got to do this 
part here first. When I say the word peace, most of us think about peace like this. We think peace and we think, well, peace is just the absence of conflict. It means to be without conflict. And there's a part of peace that actually does mean to be absent of conflict, to not be in conflict. And if that's all peace is, if that's all peace was, like a lot of us, especially here at Christmas time, we would just be happy with that. Amen? Like we, if, if that's all peace is, is the absence of conflict. When we think about peace, we're like, I would love to have peace this Christmas because I don't want to be in conflict with my coworkers. I don't want to be in conflict with my family. I don't want to be in conflict with my spouse. I don't want to be in conflict with just random people that seem to, you know, cut me off at Walmart every time I go over there. Like, you shouldn't go to Walmart anyway. I'm just kidding. Like, go to Walmart. But, like, just, like, in general, like, I, I don't, like, I just want to have peace. But I promise you, I promise you this, peace is so much more than just the absence of conflict. And especially when we look at it in the terms of the birth of Christ and the coming of Jesus, not just his birth, but the coming of Jesus, it has such a deeper, deeper meaning. And so the Bible uses the word peace this way sometimes, but primarily the word peace is used uh, two different ways. And so those are two different ways that we're going to look at. There's the Old Testament, um, Old Testament Hebrew word for peace, and then there's the New Testament uh, Greek word for peace. So let's look at the, the Old Testament word for peace. And it's a Hebrew word, Hebrew word called shalom. Shalom. Y'all say shalom? One, two, three. Shalom. Shalom to you as well. So shalom. Uh, shalom is the Hebrew word mostly used in the Old Testament for peace. Now, here's how to sort of get your mind around what the word shalom means in this meaning of peace. It's, it's sort of this, um, if, in your mind, it means to be made complete, uh, to be made whole. To, to be whole, to be complete. And so in your mind, if you will, picture this. Picture a large boulder, huge, huge boulder. I don't know if you've ever been up to the Great Smoky Mountains and been to like uh, the Chimney Rock uh, Trail or uh, to uh, the Chimneys, uh, the Chimneys campground area, or not campground, but the picnic area. And, and, and in the, the creek there, the river, there is these huge boulders, these big, huge rocks. And they're solid. Like there's no cracks there's no crevices in a lot of them. Like they're just solid chunks of earth. And, and, and they're massive and they're big. There's no gaps between them. They're literally whole. And so this, this meaning of the word shalom, this, this view of the word shalom here, to be made complete is to, to have no cracks, no gaps. It's whole. It's complete. It's one. The Old Testament uses lots of different examples of this version, of this form of shalom. You don't have to turn there, but in, uh, again, we're going to flip around a lot here, but 1 Samuel chapter 17, David, uh, King David, he, he has not assumed the throne yet. Uh, David is still kind of a teenager at this point. Uh, his brothers, he's got several brothers, but he has three older brothers who are uh, in Saul's army. And so they are on the front lines of the battlefield against the Philistines, which is where Goliath is. And so this is right before David fights Goliath. But the reason David goes to the battlefield, the reason David faces Goliath in the first place, is because his father Jesse sends David to go check on his older brothers. And his father Jesse tells David, he says, I want you to go and I want you to check on your brothers and I want you to ask them about their shalom. I want you to ask them about their wholeness. Are, are they whole? Are they, are they well? Are they complete? And so David does just that. He goes to the front lines of, of the battle, meets his brothers there, and he asks them, he says, how is your shalom? Are you well? Are you whole? And when you think about shalom this way, when you think about peace this way, it's, it's kind of, this is sort of the, the crux of, of Christmas, right? Many of us are, are, are without shalom. We don't feel whole. We don't feel complete. We feel like we have gaps. We feel like we have fractures. We feel like we, there's something that is, that is missing in our hearts and souls. David asks his brother, he says, are, are you whole? Are you complete? 
And when things in our lives are, are out of alignment, when relationships or, or even ourselves, when we feel incomplete or without, our hearts seem to have this gap in it. And, and because of stress and anxiety and, and worries and relationships, whatever, what happens is, is that shalom, that wholeness, that completeness begins to break down. It begins to fracture. Life is no longer whole. And so therefore, it needs to be restored. It needs to be brought back to wholeness. Now again, you don't have to raise your hand for this, but how many of us feel like at times that our lives need to be brought back to wholeness, need to be brought back into shalom? This time of year seems to magnify these things for so many of us. Maybe it's because we're worried about providing, you know, a great Christmas for our family or Maybe it's money issues or job issues, relationship issues, whatever it is. Maybe it's just that, that we've lost someone close to us and, and that there feels like there's something there that feels incomplete. There's a lack of wholeness that exists in our soul. So this is one way that the Old Testament uses the word shalom and peace. And, and, and another way, uh, the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew writers would actually take the word shalom and use it as a verb. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Again, I told you I'm going to geek out with you a little bit. So um, the word shalom, when, it, when it's used as, as a verb, it actually means to bring completeness, to bring wholeness. It, it doesn't mean that it's just whole or that it's just complete. It actually means to bring completeness, to, to bring wholeness. And again, the Old Testament gives a couple of different examples of this. I want to show you one. Let's, let's look at Proverbs 16, verse 7. Proverbs 16, verse 7, it says this. It's talking about in terms of a relationship. It says, when a man's ways pleases the Lord, he makes even, listen, his enemies to be at peace with him. He makes even his enemies to be at shalom. And so in other words, what the writer of Proverbs is saying here is that a, a relationship that has conflict in it, in it isn't just somebody going, you know what? I'm going to walk into this house and I'm going to eat dinner at a different table and I'm going to avoid this person because I don't want conflict with them. It is not that. But how many of us look at peace that way? We just say, you know what, if I can just avoid this person, if I can not walk down past their desk, if I can not have to go to this family gathering, if I can not have to have that conversation, like, you know, that conversation with you and your spouse that says, hey, listen, here's the deal. Do not leave me alone with your mother-in-law. You hear me? Like, don't let that happen because I am trying to avoid conflict. How many of you are going to have that conversation here in about a week, right? Like, so, so that's the avoidance of conflict and so therefore we think that we have peace but you don't have peace you have conflict avoidance that doesn't mean that there's peace so listen what he says he says <coughs> he makes even his enemies to be at shalom with him that jesus and we'll, we'll put all this together here in a minute. Jesus is, is able to make our enemies have wholeness with us. Not that you're avoiding them and so therefore having some kind of fake peace, but that relationship is actually restored. And so this is sort of the, the active way of using the word shalom. It brings shalom. And this is, this is what God wanted for his people in the Old Testament. We see this over and over and over. This is what God wanted for the people of Israel, is to not be in conflict avoidance, but to have shalom, active wholeness, to be made complete. Much of the Old Testament is about God desiring shalom for Israel, but it didn't happen very often. And so... So the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 9, prophet Isaiah, he, he looked forward to when God would bring to them shalom through a future king, since the current kings couldn't do it. And you know this, this verse. Listen to this. This is what Isaiah writes. He says, again, this is hundreds of years before the arrival of Jesus. He says, For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle, tumulant, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. You're like, I don't know that verse. You probably don't know that one. But you know this one. They go together. 
He says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And listen to this. He says, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. What's the word? Prince of Peace. It's okay. You can say it out loud. Prince of Peace. Prince of Shalom. Prince of bringing back together what has been fractured and broken and incomplete and bringing it back together to completeness. Prince of Shalom. The Prince of Shalom would bring peace that would have no end and could not be overtaken by any other kingdom. But the promise that God would give to the people of Israel was even greater than this and even had deeper meaning than just this, this right here from what they could understand in that moment. His promise would be that he would send a king that would make right all things and bring a covenant of shalom and would heal all that had been broken. And hear me when I say this, the people of Israel, they knew what brokenness was. Because they understood, they understood that because of the fall in Genesis chapter 3, because of the fracturing of sin, that they had been separated from relationship with God unless there was a sacrifice made that brought them back into relationship with him. Much like us, that we have been fractured and separated and alienated from God through sin so the people of Israel, they understood this, and they understood what this means. And so when uh, Isaiah would say that he would be the prince of shalom, that he would be the prince of, of bringing back together what had been broken, that he would be the, the prince of bringing everything to completeness, to wholeness, this meant something to them. We don't have to go to Genesis chapter 3, but to sort of understand the fall and get a, a picture of what this means. Um, my kids, they, they, have this, uh, they have this Bible. It's called the Jesus Storybook Bible. And a lot of you have it. We use it down in Rich Kids too. But it, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful um, storybook Bible, basically. It's not, a, it's, it's not a translation of the Bible necessarily. They, they take stories in the Bible. It's really, the, the Jesus Storybook Bible is the story of God and Jesus in every scripture is basically what it is. And they take it and they do some illustrations in there. And it's sort of a, a paraphrase of the story of God. And there's a part in there that talks about Genesis chapter 3. There's a part in there that talks about the fall. And God's promise to his people. And it's just a paragraph, so I want to read it to you because it's just this beautiful picture of understanding here. But it says, it says this. It says, the end. So basically what it says, it leads up to, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden, deceived by the serpent. They eat of the fruit. God comes to them. They hide from God. And God comes to them and says, why are you hiding from me? And it's like, well, we kind of, you know, that woman over there kind of broke your law and so you know here we are right and that that whole thing and uh, and God speaks to them and he tells them what their punishment is going to be that they're going to be removed from the garden but he also gives them a promise and so listen to what it says it says, it says the end but not in this story God loved his children too much to let the story end there even though he would suffer God had a plan a magnificent dream one day, he would get his children back. One day, he would make the world their perfect home again. And one day, he would wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see, no matter what, in spite of everything, God would love his children with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And though they would forget him, run from him deep in their hearts god's children would miss him always and long for him lost children yearning for their home before they left the garden god whispered a promise to adam and eve it will not be so i will come to rescue you and when i do i'm going to do battle against the snake i will get rid of the sin and the darkness and the sadness that you let in here I am coming back for you. And he would. One day, God himself would come. Isn't that a beautiful description of the promise that God made 
to us, that he would send a savior to bring shalom, the prince of shalom. Now that's the way the Old Testament kind of frames this word peace. The New Testament, there is a Greek word, and it actually kind of means the same thing, but they use it a little bit differently, and it gives us, I think, an, an even clearer picture of this peace. And so the Greek word is actually a word called erene. Erene. Y'all want to say that one? Hey, pretty good. Y'all aren't as Appalachian American as I am. So, um, Arene, it's a Greek word. Now, again, I'm not a Hebrew or Greek scholar at all, and so I, I, I had to try to study these things to the best of my ability. But Arene means restored to wholeness, restored to completeness. Restored to wholeness. Now, again, so shalom is to be made whole, to be made complete. And then arene is an active word of peace, meaning restored to wholeness, restored to completeness. And so when the birth of Christ was announced, the word that is used there, the word peace, is the word arene. So listen to this. We'll finish up here in just a moment. Luke chapter 2, the angels are announcing the birth of Christ to the shepherds. And they, he, they use the word, the word arene is used. Listen to this. It says, the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and listen, and on earth a reign. And on earth a reign, a peace among those with whom he is pleased. It's the arrival of restoration, the arrival of wholeness, the arrival of being made complete. And then Jesus, in his own words, Jesus would use the word arene in John chapter 14, uh, verse uh, 27, where he says this, he says, peace, arene, he says, arene that I leave with you, peace I leave with you. Listen to this, my peace, my arene, that I give to you. Understand how huge this is. Jesus is telling his disciples, just like he's telling you and me, he's saying this. He's saying, I don't just come to bring wholeness and completeness and arene. I am peace. He says, so my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And he goes on, he says, but not as the world gives do I give to you. You see, in our minds, again, in our minds, we have this understanding of peace that does not translate in the Scriptures. Because for you and I, for many of us, the, our understanding of peace, our uh, comfort level with peace centers around, do I have a good retirement plan? Is my, 401, my 401k okay? Do I have a car that's going to start and move when I want it to and get to point A to point B? Am I healthy? Am I happy? Do I have all the things that I need to succeed in life? All of those things, like we think that if we have all of these things, then everything is cool, everything is okay, and therefore, if I'm healthy, happy, happy and okay, then I have a level of peace in my life. But Jesus says, this is not the kind of peace that I give you because that kind of peace can be erased with a text message. There's not a single one of us in this room who could not get a text message right now in this moment that if that is our understanding of peace, that it is absolutely erased. Now, the funny thing is, is in the first service when I said that, I got a text message. I'm not joking, I'm not even kidding. My watch went ding, and it vibrated. And I thought, God, what are you doing? It was red box. I got two ninety nine off. I have peace. Whew. I was worried about paying that two ninety nine for that movie. But Jesus says, L "Listen, this is not the kind of peace I give you." And so he, listen, he says, "Let not your hearts be troubled." And do not be afraid. Why can your heart? Why does your heart not to be, need to be troubled? And why do you not need to be afraid? Because Jesus says, 
I am giving you a reine. I am giving you completeness and wholeness and a peace that is greater than any kind of earthly peace that we could ever try to put our minds around. I'll show you why this is important really quickly. This is what Paul says. Paul says, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace. We have a reine with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is that important? Because if you understand peace to just be the absence of conflict, that doesn't make you feel very good. That we have peace absence of conflict with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That means that you could have conflict with God. And you don't want that because you're going to lose. But he says this, he says, we have been justified by faith. We have a reine, we have completeness. We've been made whole and complete with God. Listen, how do you get that peace? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only way. That is the only way to have that peace. That is the only way to feel complete. That is the only way to have this wholeness. That is the only way to have this peace. He goes on. He says, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. And I love this last line. He says, And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Paul is saying that Jesus has made peace between sinful people and God when he died and he rose again. He literally restored wholeness between us and God. In Ephesians, to the, to the Ephesians, Paul says it like this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, he says, For he himself, he himself is our peace. Jesus, he is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinance, ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making so making peace jesus is the whole complete person that we were made to be but we continually fail at trying to be but because he is our peace because he doesn't just give us peace because he is our peace when we have jesus as savior we are made whole we are made complete we are restored from brokenness his life, his peace makes us complete and makes us whole to bring us to this place of shalom. And how does he accomplish that? Ephesians, or Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, he says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things. That word reconcile is just kind of another word for arene. Reconcile means to take what is broken and fractured and scattered and to bring back together. That's what it means to reconcile. It says he will reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace. How does he make that peace? By the blood of his cross. The only, listen, hear me when I say this, church. The only way to have this is through the cross of Jesus Christ. And maybe you're thinking, it's like, well, what is, like, I thought we were talking about Christmas, like six pound, eight ounce baby Jesus, you don't even know a word yet, like that, that baby Jesus thing, I thought we were talking about that. Like, why are we talking about the cross? Here's why we're talking about the cross, is because you cannot untangle the cross from the manger. You can't have one without the other. You have to have both. Paul says it this way later, he says that if Jesus Christ did not if he was not crucified and resurrected, our faith is worthless. You have to have the cross, and you have to have the manger. You cannot untangle them from each other. So we celebrate Christmas, but we also celebrate the cross. So here's, here's why all of this is important for us. 
Why is it important for us to have this understanding of shalom and arene and, and this peace, this completeness and this wholeness? We live in a time and season, and it's not just this particular season, it's just where we are in this moment in space and time that we need peace more than we've ever needed peace in, in not only ourselves but in our world. Amen? With political unrest, racial division, anxiety and depression is at pandemic levels within our culture. If there has ever been a season that we need this kind of peace, it is now. It is now. But here's what I've come to understand is that all of this stuff is not going to stop. There's going to be anxiety, there's going to be depression, there's going to be racial division, there's going to be all, all this stuff. None of it is going to stop until Jesus returns. And I believe that he is coming back. That is the second advent. See, we celebrate the first advent by, by talking about and celebrating the birth of Christ, but we look forward to the arrival of the second advent, the coming of Jesus for his children to bring final shalom, final peace, final wholeness, final completeness. But until then, we have a Savior who is Prince of Peace. And in the midst of all of the personal chaos that you and I may be experiencing, here's what I know to be true, is that He can bring peace to you if you will take Him as your peace, as your shalom, as your Savior. And it's because He paid the cost to bring this to us, to reconcile us to Himself from the cross, on the cross. And listen, it is absolutely possible that you have no peace in your life right now, that you feel an incompleteness, that you feel a brokenness, that you feel a scatteredness in your life. And, and so I, w- I would say one of two things is true for you. If that's how you feel, one of two things is true for you. Either one, you do not know Jesus as Savior because he is peace. Or two, maybe you know Jesus as Savior, but yet you still feel that way. Paul actually gives us an answer to that. It's like, well, I have Jesus as Savior. I know Jesus is my Lord. Like, I've given my life to him. I do my, like, I try to follow him, but, like, there's still a part of me that feels incomplete, that that needs restored, that needs reconciliation. Why do I feel that way? This is what Paul says. Listen to this. I'll close here. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Paul says it this way. He says, do not be anxious about anything. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, not some things, not just the things we're okay with, not just a few things. He says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, he says, let your requests be made known to God. And what happens if you will let your requests be made known to God? This is what Paul says. He says this, he says, and the peace, the arene, the completeness, the wholeness, the reconciliation, and the peace of of your hearts and or, or the peace that passes all understanding, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know what that means? That means that, that we take our worries, our anxieties, the places where we feel incomplete and broken and unwhole, and we lay them before the feet of Jesus, and we just say, God, here they are. I'm going to trust you with them. I'm going to lay these at your feet, and I'm going to walk away, and I'm going to trust you to be my peace. And Paul says this. Paul says, I want to explain to you exactly how this works, but I can't. I don't understand it. I don't know how this works. I just know I lay these things at his feet, and the understanding, this peace that I get from that, it surpasses all understanding. I don't understand it. I can't put it into words. It just does. And it'll do the same for you too. And it'll do the same for me. 
that when we trust Jesus as our shalom, as our arene, as our complete wholeness of peace, the one who is peace. He doesn't just bring you peace. It's not just temporary peace that is here one day and goes away the next. It is everlasting, deep-rooted peace in Jesus Christ. Because he is our peace. So we're, as we close this morning, we're going we're gonna to sing a song together. We're going to... Um, we're going to sing Silent Night. And, and I, love, um, I love this song for, for this moment because it's such a peaceful song, right? Like every time I hear the song, like I, I, I feel peace. But if Jesus isn't our peace, we can listen to that song as many times as we want and then walk out of these doors and let chaos ruin ourselves. And so we have to make Jesus our peace. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. God, sometimes, sometimes your words to us can be complicated and maybe somewhat hard to understand or wrap our minds around God. So, Father, I just pray in this moment that, God, if we're struggling in that place, God, that, that you reveal yourself to us, that you speak loudly to our hearts and to our souls, God, that, that you are our peace. God, that nothing else in this world is going to bring us peace like you do. Nothing else can compete with who you are as our peace, the one who brings us to wholeness, the one who brings us into completeness, the one who reconciles all things because you, recon- you reconciled all things in your body on the cross to bring to us this peace. So, Father, all across the room, God, I pray for every, every person in the room, God, every person watching online, every person who may watch later, God, God, I pray that, that in this moment, that, that as we pray to you, God, that you give us the courage to lay down at your feet any place, any spot in our soul that feels incomplete, that feels broken, that doesn't feel whole. And with a peace that surpasses all understanding, God, you do what only you can do. And Father, for any any person who is yet to, to give their lives to you, who's yet to pray and say, Jesus, save me. God, would you speak to them in this moment? God, would you speak so loudly to them, God, that they trust you in this moment, that they lay down themselves at your feet and that you save them. As we sing this song together, I don't want you to stand in this moment. I actually just want you to sit. I want you to continue to contemplate and pray and think through what do you need to lay at his feet? What false sense of hope have you been trying to give yourself that will bring some sort of earthly peace to yourself that has been fleeting and running and not fulfilling your soul? That you just lay that at his feet. And then when you're ready, Come and take communion together, the picture of wholeness, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ that brings us to a place of shalom.
Let's give us up for the band today for leading us. Thank you, guys. <coughs> hey, we're so glad that you were here today. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for watching online. Hey, don't forget, next Sunday is our Christmas services. Next Sunday, uh, the 22nd. And so we the times are different. So make sure you grab an invite card on your way out. Take some to your friends, family, invite them out. But uh, we have a 10 o'clock service. Now, that service is the kids are going to be in here with us. And so if you have a kid in Ridge Kids, they're going to be singing their Christmas songs during that service uh, with us. And so they will be in, in here for the 10 o'clock service. So that will be happening at 10 o'clock. And then we have a 5 o'clock and a 7 o'clock service as well. And they'll be having Ridge Kids stuff going on downstairs for them during that time. Well, they'll be kind of doing their own thing. We'll be up here doing our thing. Every service is a candlelight service. And so it's going to be a lot of fun, a great time just to come out, celebrate the season of Christmas together, celebrate Jesus. And so don't forget 10 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 
and 7 o'clock right here next Sunday. And then, last thing I'll say, the next Sunday after that, the last Sunday in the year, we don't have services here at Ridge Church. There'll be no services here. Uh, you can show up here and hang out, but I won't be here. And so uh, hopefully you won't be here either. We give everybody that week off because we want you to spend that time with your family. We want our volunteers to have a time to just chill and relax and recharge as we hit the year at the beginning of the year in January. And so we'll see you back next Sunday, 10 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock. Merry Christmas. We'll see you then. Don't forget if you want to carol, go caroling with us tonight too. 5 o'clock, Briarcliff Subdivision. Please join us. <laughs> that too. <laughs> his will be done, his kingdom come on earth as is above. Who is himself our daily bread? Praise him.